All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I will introduce myself first, and um, we have three junior senior counselors with us here today who I will let introduce themselves, and then we'll have Aaron Betcher from University of Illinois Springfield introduce themselves. So we um, will go ahead and do that. My name is Paige Bottles here at the Batavia High School. I am the college career counselor. My name is Mandy Yelm. I am the junior senior counselor for students with last names starting with A through G. I'm Erin Hack, and I am a junior senior counselor for all students with the last names that start with H through O. Hello and good afternoon. I am Corey Bernard. I am the counselor for all students with last names P through Z. And then, hi, I'm Aaron Betcher. I'm not with Batavia. I'm with the University <laughs> of Illinois at Springfield. I'm Associate Director of Admissions, and I've been at UIS now for about 19 years. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. Um, we went through all of the questions that were submitted with the registration for today's events. Um, we've talked and come up with, um, you know, kind of answers for you. And so we're going to start with that. Um, the first question, uh, Mrs. Hack is going to answer for us. And this question came up quite a few times. So Mrs. Hack, can you give us some financial aid guidance in planning for college? Sure, absolutely. So for my parents that are here on the call today, if any of you have older kids, you may have remembered that um, you completed the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, beginning October 1st of their senior year. Well, beginning next year, some things may change. Um, due to the FAFSA Simplification Act, the U.S. government has said that potentially the FAFSA form will not open until next year, the beginning of December. Um, so there is a little bit up in the air. So um, please keep in mind that your BHS counselors will really make sure that we are letting you know um, the exact timeline for when the FAFSA will be opening and we will be supporting you with the FAFSA. A um, couple things to know about the new form. Um, it does actually simplify the FAFSA. So for those of you who have gone through it before, uh, you know that it is quite a headache. It's going from 108 questions down to 36. Also, it's gonna make a lot better use of the IRS data retrieval tool. So there's less that you'll have to actually input manually into the FAFSA. So for those of you who are wondering, what is the FAFSA? This is my first rodeo. Um, Again, the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid and is the one way that students become eligible for federal student grants and loans. We do recommend that every single senior completes it. Um, the grants and loans that you get can be used at community colleges, four-year universities, and even some trade schools as, as, as well. At BHS, we will be supporting you through FAFSA Fest, where we will invite all parents of seniors, that's you, uh, to come into the school and get some help completing your FAFSA. Also, we partner with ISAC, which is the Illinois Student Assistance Commission, to help you if you need any one-on-one -on -one support with the FAFSA. We can arrange meetings with you and our ISAC rep here at the school, and you can also connect with them virtually. So please know that there will be lots of support for you um, in the area of financial aid once your student gets to become a senior at the beginning of next year. Awesome. Thanks, Mrs. Hack. Um, and I should have started with this way. If you guys have questions throughout this, um, you guys joined us here live today. So you certainly can ask any questions. Um, but all the questions you submitted on your form, we do have answers to. But if you want us to elaborate on anything, you can unmute yourself or you can just type into the chat. and We will um, help you out that way, too. OK, so the next question, and this was submitted several times, was about how do I select a college major? What advice do we have for students um, who might have multiple interests? So I'm going to share some of our um, most known or well-known resources and suggestions. And if anyone has anything to add, especially you, Erin, if when I kind of wrap up, if you have anything to add from your perspective, we would welcome that. Um, I'm going to start by showing you some of the resources that we have on our website. Um, for selecting a college major. So I'm going to share my screen. Sorry, students are walking back from lunch right now. We do work at the high school and I'm in the hallway. So sorry if it's a little noisy. Okay, share my screen. All right. You guys see the Batavia High School website here? Does that mean yes? Yep, we're good. Okay, great. Thank you. So here on the Batavia High School website, if we scroll to the bottom under departments, it says counseling and advising. So I wanted to show you that this exists for one, if you haven't checked it out before. Here you can see contact for information for all of the counselors. So you guys 
if you click on our names, um, that will send us an email. And you can also reach out to us by phone. Um, we have more information and resources broken down by grade level as well as topic. So I'm going to start by clicking on college planning. And there's a variety of resources here. If you click on financial aid, it would kind of show you some FAFSA completion tips and more resources we have there. I'm going to click on presentations, choosing your major. So here is a slide and a recorded video for students to kind of go over some of the tips that we give for students um, as they're trying to figure out their college major. One of the other suggestions I give to students is to look at a college's website um, to learn more about a major they might be interested in. So for example, if a student wanted to study engineering, they could just look up the name of a college like University of Illinois um, Champaign Urbana, and they could look at the college's website, read about the um, what they would be studying as far as like what classes they would be taking, and just get a feel for that. Um, looking at the college's website and seeing which courses you would be taking specifically can be really helpful to students. So maybe you have to put in course sequence, and it usually it gives you like a map of what classes you would be taking. So here you can see exactly what you'd be taking if you were studying there. And this does vary college to college and can also give an idea for students what college might be the best fit for them. So are they interested in these types of classes? Typically, if you click on it, it gives you a little bit more information about what that class is. So that's another idea. Um, I really like mymajors.com. Um, students can create a free profile here or they can just um, search by major. Um, so they can take an assessment and this is a, an assessment where they can learn more about the major that they're interested in. So, or they can just look up a major here. So if they wanted to learn more about theater, type in theater, see what kind of careers are associated, different colleges. Um, I click on musical theater, it just gives me an idea of usually what kind of classes they take, what other majors might be related, what schools have it, and then related careers. So I really like mymajors.com. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. That's our go-tos. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? I might just jump on page and, and say, when it comes to majors, I think it's probably the one thing that high school students stress out about the most that has the littlest to do with the college process. And yes, if you apply to my sister campus in Urbana-Champaign, they admit you by major. But in majority of cases, eight out of 10 seniors at Batavia High School are going to change majors on average three times in college. That's what college is for. That's the purpose. It's not that you take a test at 17. I know your, your kids are taking a test called the SAT, right, in high school. But in some countries, they take a test of that day, and then that's their job for the rest of their life based on how they score in a test. And uh, what college does is it exposes you to a lot of different types of courses for you to understand where your talents and skills come into play. Sometimes being on campus, you're going to join clubs, organizations, activities, and you're going to have professors that let you know more about those kinds of things. I mean, um, and, and I'd finish off with this. The last thing I, I want to say with this is like, as you choose a major, it's really about what do you want to study? There's only a handful of careers that you need an exact degree for. Yes, if you want to be a school counselor, you eventually need a master's degree in school counseling. Okay. If you want to be a nurse, if you want to be, you know, a lawyer or a doctor, you've got to get specific degrees. Many times for the doctor and lawyer, they're, they're graduate level degrees. They have undergrad degrees in, in some weird things sometimes. But in many careers, like for me, I did finance. I love strategy. I loved numbers and strategy. So finance is where I went to because it's all about strategy and numbers. It doesn't mean I have to have a job in finance. I coach college basketball. I work in admissions. Guess what college admissions is now? Numbers, analytics, data, and data analytics and strategy. That's, that's what this is. And so we have students that majored in English. They're great writers. They know how to research. They, that's what they love. And so you're really taking that skill set and, and figuring out where it's the best fit for you um, to, to graduate with. So hopefully that maybe takes some pressure off some of the parents as, as you ask that question, because most students come up with a major because every person asks them, hey, what are you going to study in college? Like that's the first question. So they just have something. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's really about letting your talents and skills just kind of go where they're supposed to. 
Yeah, thank you, Erin. I think I kind of went straight to the point of resources, but I love your like more philosophical reasoning here. Um, I agree, students don't have to have it all figured out. Um, we as their school counselors do want them to reflect on who they are as people and what their strengths are, and, you know, where their skills and abilities lie and trying to focus on what they're good at. And sometimes that does correlate then with their future career, which could impact their college major. But a lot of people in like professional roles, their college major isn't exactly what their career is. Going into a career is not the same as picking a college major. It's what you want to study more of. Um, so the two are not always necessarily equal. Like Erin said, you know, nursing, teaching, engineering, yes, you do have to have that undergraduate degree, but it isn't always a super linear pathway. It's about learning and growing and like becoming closer to the version of yourself that you want to be as an adult. So thank you for kind of zooming out there for a moment and taking that off. Um, and in college, some, you know, there's kind of two frames of thought that I've heard of. Some people say, you know, don't go to college and waste money unless you know what you want to become. And then there's is just as many other people who say, go to college with an open mind and trying to figure out who you are in those next few years. And we know um, that that is certainly going to change even throughout their adult lives. So. All right. Another thing I was going to mention, too, is we have access to a, a resource called U-Science. And U-Science is career assessments. Um, it's based on aptitudes and research and data. So it's not the same like short assessments that we take throughout freshman and sophomore year when I push into their English classes. We do career assessments on Naviance. U-Science is a it is a paid subscription that we paid for, but it's free to our students. And like I said, it's it's re based on research. So that is another resource if a student really wants to figure out what they want to do career wise after high school. Um, any of your students can email me and I can set up an account for them and I would be happy to do that. And like that could help them figure out what kind of majors might be a best fit. And we always encourage students to job shadow, talk with professionals in careers that they're interested in as they're trying to figure out what their next steps are. So if, if your family has any connections to careers that your student might be interested in, maybe a phone conversation or a visit at work, or if you need help finding someone, um, I'm happy to do that as well. And we use our whole school as resources sometimes to figure out, like if we don't know someone in our counseling office, um, many of our staff members are able to help set that up. So. All right, I think that's enough about college majors for now. Um, next, Mrs. Bernard, she's going to talk to us about the timeline of the college application process. Yeah, so I'm just going to give, I'm going to provide a general overview of the application process from starting the summer to the very end of your student's senior year. And then I'll show you where you can find more detailed timelines depending on um, any given moment in time. Um, if you're now that your students are juniors, what they can be doing now, what they can be doing over the summer, and then of course when they come back their senior year. So in a nutshell, so this process, at this point in time, we would want our students to be starting to formulate their list of colleges, um, thinking about where they would like to apply, maybe doing some visits, taking advantage of those opportunities right now. College applications, some will open as early as, I've heard of a few even in June, some in July, the majority will open in August. August one is a, a common one. Most all applications will be open though as at the latest September 1st. So I'm, I'm telling you this just so you understand and know that this is coming. Um, and again, some will open very early in the summer, but August is typically what we see for college applications opening. So coming into a student's senior year, we would want them again, finalizing that list of colleges that they're planning to apply to, starting the application process and working towards that. In November, this is when we commonly see early action deadlines. So this is going to vary based on college, but the most common early action deadline that we see from colleges is November 1st. Sometimes we'll see November 15th, sometimes December 1st, sometimes as early as October 15th. Um, but again, have your student look at those deadlines, make sure they're noting them. We do strongly encourage students to apply early action so that they can just be having more opportunities open to them. Typically, students have to apply by early action deadlines in order to receive any sort of scholarship, merit-based, need-based. So we want them to be applying early if at all possible. 
Okay, so that's going to come around November. Um, December, January is typically when we'll see regular action deadlines, not for all schools. Some schools are on rolling admissions. I know Erin can speak to this, but I believe UIS is on, on rolling admissions. Um, but typically those that have regular decision deadlines are going to hit around December and January. And then around between December and March, this is when we'll typically see financial aid packages being distributed to students. Um, also in the winter months between like December and March is really when we're going to see a lot of our local scholarships become available. So I know we have a lot of students who will come in first thing their senior year, really ambitious to, you know, knock out their college applications, but also get going on scholarships and they can absolutely start applying to local scholarships then we just don't have a ton available at the beginning of the school year um, so the way we like to see or the way we see this is the fall semester is really dedicated towards applying to college and getting those college applications submitted and then around December and then throughout second semester is really when we hit hard with local scholarships and students are, are applying to those and then to wrap up the year on May 1st, that's um, the national notification deadline. So students have to commit to a college, typically pay their deposit by May 1st, and that's when they're committing to their, their college, was, which is exciting. So that's just a general overview of kind of how this process looks um, from start to finish throughout a student's senior year. I am gonna take you on a little field trip here to see our college dashboard. I got to remember how to share my screen. I was so skilled at Google Meets when, during the pandemic and we've gotten away from it so much that I'm rusty. Okay. And while Mrs. Bernard brings that up too, I was going to say oftentimes you won't know how much it's going to cost for your student to attend each college until they get their financial aid award letter. And that varies school to school, but it's not until after they apply that they get it. Typically we see them in like February and March, sometimes earlier in January, but February and March sometimes as late as April. And that's when students can compare college to college, um, how much it's going to cost for them to attend and what kind of scholarships they were given and so on. I'd also recommend as you are on the college's websites, please be sure to use the net price calculators on each of the college's website to determine if the price for that college um, is in your price range as a family. And we do recommend that you have a conversation as a family with, you know, how much have we saved? Can we afford college? You know, what types of scholarships um, and financial aid will you need in order to make college a reality. So we know that conversation can be uncomfortable, um, but it's definitely very important to do um, as you're looking up the prices for these colleges using their net price calculators. For sure. Thanks, guys. So what I have here, this is a resource that we have on our counseling and advising webpage um, through our the BHS website. I think this is also included as a link on any one of our emails um, too, because it's something that we really like to get in the hands of our, our students, um, especially our seniors as they're going through this process. So what this is, this is our BHS college dashboard. This was actually created at the start of the pandemic when we were frantically trying to find a, a one-stop shop for students to find answers to a lot of the questions that they were having. Um, this is what we have created and we've had a lot of success with it um, because we get a lot of the same questions. So on here you will see this is we've created tiles again to address those common questions that we have. So how to explore colleges, how do I request transcripts, um, how, how do I create a resume, how do I use the Common App. But the one that I'm going to draw your attention to right now since we're still on the topic of college timelines this first tile that you see up at the top left here, if you click on here, you will see various timelines that we've created. So if we look at our junior year timeline, this will lead you and your student to kind of a step-by-step -step on where they should be at in this process, some things that they should be doing they can check themselves there. If I go back here, we have one for the summer before senior year. So again, this is a great way to, to go through the list of items that we have here, make sure that they're staying on target and not falling behind. Um, so again, just wanted you to know that this resource is here. It's to help you guys and your students through this process. Of course, we're always here for questions, um, but this is a great place if you need a quick answer to, to look.
Thanks, Mrs. Bernard. Um, the next question we got was about scholarships. How do we apply? What is the process and the timeline? And we touched on that just briefly, but I'm going to go over like kind of what I call my spiel of how to prioritize your scholarship search. So first and foremost, um, when students apply to college, make sure that they understand what the scholarship after award process is at each college and if they have deadlines and timelines internally that students need to be aware of. Sometimes when students apply to college, their application is simply their how they're considered for scholarships and other times students have to apply separately to those scholarships that they want to be considered for within the college. And this does vary school to school. So as you're organized, as your students are organizing themselves and figuring out when do I need to apply for um, apply in order to be considered for this college. Also make sure that they're mindful of when the scholarships are due and how they award them. Um, so people like within the college admissions office, like Aaron at UIS, those are the go-to people to ask those questions um, outside of the college's website. Sometimes you can find that, but sometimes it's not clearly stated. Um, so first and foremost, Make sure that you know how the scholarships are awarded by each college and trying to um, and making sure that you're following those deadlines. Very rarely will colleges make exceptions for those deadlines that they have internally. Um, second is the local scholarships that we offer um, or that we we don't offer them. They're, they come from the community, um, but we put those on Navia. And we also have a Google Doc that you can read through. And this is a public document. So even as juniors, I always encourage students and families to take a look at that. You can't apply for them right now. Your students can't apply since they're only for seniors. Um, at this point, they're almost all passed. We only have a couple still available here in April. But they start getting posted, um, usually October, November, and then heavily December, January, and February is like the most common time for scholarships. So I would encourage students to put a weekly reminder on however they keep track of themselves, like on their phone, maybe on Sundays, if they're typically available from five to six, check the Google Doc or Naviance and just apply for any scholarships that they're closely relevant to being, you know, ex like, to be considered. Um, sometimes they have really strict considerations, but if a student's close to those things that they're looking for, or those requirements, we encourage them to apply. We also will have a handful of local community foundation scholarships is what they're called. And these are applications that students can apply just one time for the scholarship, and they can be considered for hundreds of different scholarships. So we'll send emails about those as they become available, but I just want you to be aware of that as well. Um, so, if, like I said, college, and then looking at local scholarships. As a high school junior, students could be asking um, any community connections or job connections that they have if there are scholarships available, perhaps through their place of work or through their parents or guardians. Sometimes there's scholarships, uh, sometimes local churches or community organizations like the Elks or places like that might have scholarships that we don't always know about, but anything that your student or your family is connected to is worth asking to see if they have scholarships available. So most of the time, scholarships are not available for students until they are seniors to apply for. Um, but as a junior, doing the research and like starting to create that list of scholarships they'll apply for when they're seniors is recommended. And then last in our um, prioritization would be what we call the national scholarship search. So these are search engines that if you Googled scholarships or scholarships my student can apply for, you might find yourself on websites like FastWeb, Peterson's, Going Mary. There are so many different ones. Um, students can create a profile where they talk, you know, they answer questions about themselves, their demographics, age, and so forth. And then these search engines will match students with, or I'm sorry, match the students with scholarships that they are eligible to apply for. Um, so students can apply for these scholarships. They're just le less likely to get them since they are national. And so students from all over the country are applying for them. Um, so as, as you think about scholarships, we just want you to understand how to prioritize your time. Most of the local ones are only awarded for students when they're seniors and not renewable, meaning that they won't be able to reuse them each year of college. But those $500,000 scholarships can really add up, pay for books um, and, and, and different things. So we encourage students to apply for as many scholarships as they can. Okay, if anyone has anything to add, they may. Otherwise, you got something here? Yeah, I was gonna say the only other thing that I think a lot of families forget about when it comes to college scholarships is many places that hire high school students 
give tuition assistance. It's literally the easiest scholarship you can get because if you work at McDonald's and you work part time when you're in college, they give you twenty five hundred dollars for college. That's ten grand over four years. Plus, they're giving you a paycheck. You know, Chipotle, Amazon, uh, Best Buy, uh, Kroger, Starbucks, all these different places have have really generous. I think Taco Bell is over a five thousand dollar a year scholarship or tuition assistance now I means super generous stuff. Yes, your student will have a commitment during college to be a most times it is some sort of part time employee or they have to reach a certain amount of working hours um, based on a certain timeline set by that company. But that's another way to earn some money for college. Um, and I don't think enough high school students take that into consideration when they're when they're looking. I mean, as in my role, I hear these kids all the time like, oh, yeah, I just quit my job at McDonald's. I'm like, you just threw away ten thousand dollars for college. They're like, what? I'm like, you just threw away ten grand for college. And they're probably not going to rehire you because most of the time when they quit, there was a reason behind it. So I'm like, try to uh, look for jobs as, as your students job hunt maybe this summer for maybe their first job. There are a bunch of places in your community right up Randall Road that are literally wanting to hire people when you walk in the door and they will help pay for college. Great thoughts, Aaron. Um, the next question uh, we will ask Aaron again, um, when should students apply? I know Mrs. Bernard talked about kind of like a zoomed out process. I think one of the questions within that would also be like, if a student applies early admission, so before that November 1st deadline, is, is it better to apply as soon as the application opens over the fall or is applying a couple days before the deadline going to give them the same consideration? Can you tell us from your lens how important that is? Yeah, great question. And so if there's an early, you said, action deadline, it doesn't matter when you apply. If it's August 1st, if it's October 1st, if it's October 30th, as long as everything is in, and I would recommend doing it October 15th, because once you get close to a deadline, many times everything doesn't get in. But as long as that student applies by that deadline, they're going to be in the exact same consideration as, as everybody else. Your school has a, has a really amazing program that they, it's October 13th this upcoming year, right, Paige? All right, yeah, I'm seeing yeah. the head shake. All right, <laughs> October 13th, where college professionals will come in and read application essays um, and give a really great advice uh, in different panels and, and different things. And so sometimes it's a benefit to maybe submit your application shortly after that. I would get everything ready to go. Many times these application things, whether you apply on Common App. Some of you might ask, what's Common App? Common App is an application that can be submitted to almost a thousand schools right now in the country. All your publics in Illinois are on there. A lot of privates in Illinois are on there. So if your student's applying to probably three or four schools that are on Common App, I'd probably recommend Common App. If you're applying just you know, to some other universities not on there, then you can apply directly through their website. We as a university do not care how you apply. Uh, again, there's there's no real benefit that way. We're, we're making admission decisions based on, on the information that you've got there. But based on the types of activities that Batavia High School has set up for seniors, I would probably tell you if your school has a November 1st deadline or November 15th, those are some very common deadlines, to probably have everything ready to go Go to your uh, senior boot camp on, on the 13th of October. Get some feedback from people who make admission decisions and then hit the submit button as you make those corrections over the next couple of days. That would probably be where I would tell you to, to go with that. You can request transcripts ahead of that, like, before you know, and, and get those things ready to go. So as as they're submitted, everything else is, is going through for you. Well, thanks for the special shout out. That was something we would have like that we would mention. And so yeah, our kids will have access to what we call the senior college boot camp, where we have 25 to 40 different colleges coming to talk with kids and giving them insider advice. And so yeah, part of that will getting the can be getting their college essay reviewed from someone who works at admissions for a living and does this all the time. So we would encourage students to take advantage of that. Um, next, Mrs. Yelm is going to talk to us about Naviance. We had some submissions asking, like, I hear seniors use Naviance a lot. Can you tell us what our students will be using it for? 
Yeah, so our seniors are going to use Naviance um, for two big things, which is requesting those transcripts to be sent over to the colleges, also requesting their letters of recommendation. All of that will be done through Naviance. One thing I've noticed with some of my students is some of them have trouble signing into Naviance. They have to make sure they sign in using the single sign-on. I just had a student the other day who said, my password's not working. They have to use single sign-on to get into Naviance. Um, the things that they can be doing now even are there's the college search tools on Naviance. There's also, um, that it's a great place to start a list, adding your colleges as they've kind of identified what colleges they're interesting in, interested in, adding those to their list on Naviance. Um, they'll also use it to see what colleges are visiting VHS. Um, and then next year, they'll have that list of scholarships that we've mentioned a couple of times. will be on Naviance as well. And there's both um, some tiles on that college dashboard that Mrs. Bernard showed us and also on the website that Mrs. Buttles showed us that um, we'll talk more about Naviance or the specifics of how to request those things on Naviance. Thank you. Um, our next question was about test optional. Um, so good. Erin, could you tell us a bit about what is test optional? What is the landscape? And how do I know if I, my students should apply test optional or not? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and in all reality, and, and maybe some parents on here had students that went to college pre-COVID or even went to college back in the early 2000s, the whole landscape has changed. I'm going to let you know that when I started in admissions, when you took like the SAT that all the kids just took in the high school, you could send scores to schools. Admissions offices could see which number you ranked it, one, two, three, or four. And then if you paid, you know, five and six were pay things. And so we would rank kids who sent us, who put us number one first, two second, five, because you had to pay for us, third, then so on, and then jump back to three and four. Then they did away with this stuff. And now everybody's going away from the test scores. So the whole landscape has changed. And, and I know if you've gone through this process, what I'm going to tell you might be brand new. Every school right now, for the most part, is some sort of test something fancy afterwards. Optional is, the, is one of them, but you might hear test free or test blind. or blind. All kind of means the same thing. Okay. What it means is that you can apply to that school and get an admission decision without submitting any type of ACT or SAT test score. At Illinois Springfield, we are test optional, meaning that if a student wants to send us a test score, we will take that into consideration. Now, not every school is like this, but if you send me a test score that I don't think is good, I just act like it's not there, okay? I cannot tell you that's going to happen at every school. So my advice, is that you need to contact the person like me at the school that you are applying to. Because let's say you have a list of five to seven schools that, that maybe you're thinking of applying to. You might have a test score that's really awesome for three of them, average for one of them, and not that good for the other couple. And even if it's awesome to get into a school, it might hurt you for honors admission. It might hurt you for direct entry nursing, or a different program that requires some sort of test score. And so the only person who can honestly answer that question at the school is the actual admissions counselor. I know you might have a friend that works in a faculty there. They're not, they're not knowledgeable about how admissions works. I'm just going to be completely honest. You've got to reach out to us. And so as your students get that score back from, from the SAT that they took in school, Having that score is great, and we as an admissions office will work with that student as they go through the process. My honest opinion is probably not sending that score. I know you can see if you're in the middle 50 percentile, and uh, Naviance, like uh, I think Amanda was just talking about, has some great information there about Batavia students, who gets admitted, what their average test scores were. Like you can kind of see that range, but then again, at my sister campus at Urbana-Champaign, getting into engineering, computer science, or business is a much different game than getting into some other majors. And so what's a good test score for one student at Urbana-Champaign is not a good test score for another student, even applying to the same university. Um, students that are applying test-free or test-blind, that means even if you submit it, they're not going to look at your test score. But you know, there are other schools that claim to be test optional. And what I mean by that is you need the test score 
for a scholarship or you need a test score for um, some sort of entry. Like at Illinois Springfield, I, I call it true test optional. We don't need it for honors. I don't even need it for direct entry nursing. And we have the number one program in the state. So it, it I just bring that up because every school is going to be really, really different um, with how that works. But my advice, and I know students aren't always comfortable with this, is that they need to message the admissions counselor at that school. Um, your counselors know us. Uh, you know, I mean, it, if a student has a question and maybe they're not comfortable talking to me, but they're talking to, to Paige, Paige will just send me an email. You know, your counselors know us. They're going to send us emails um, if, if, if that's a more comfortable route for the student to go. Uh, but I can tell you that reaching out to us shows a level of interest in our institutions. And you might hear of a term called demonstrated interest. It's a really good predictor of whether or not a student will graduate from the institution they choose. And so I'm not saying that that student always gets a bump in the admission stuff, but we know certain students and, and we fight for certain students behind closed doors. And, and typically those are the ones that we've built a relationship with, um, you know, just based on emails, on text messages, on seeing them at high schools, on who their counselors are, are telling us about uh, those types of things. Thanks, Aaron. A couple of things I wanted to elaborate on that Aaron mentioned was that sometimes college majors are more competitive than others within a college. So, for example, University of Illinois, um, Champaign, that or Champaign Urbana. I don't know why I'm like st struggling to say this today. They are um, like their engineering is going to have a much higher standard for an SAT score than like their education or their general admitted students. So, um, some more competitive majors, just generally speaking, are engineering, business, nursing. Sometimes the average student who's admitted has a higher academic profile, meaning a higher grade point average and or SAT or ACT score um, than just the general admitted student. So those are sometimes listed on the website very transparently, most often not. But like at U of I Urbana-Champaign, they do have admitted um, student academic profiles by major. And so um, we're going to share a resource at the end that has some links of, for further exploration. And that's one example. Um, hey, so can I add one thing to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's take two students that got a 1470 SAT for engineering at Urbana. You can get that score a different way. You can get 800 in math and a 670 mm -hmm. in English, or you can get an 800 in English and a 670 in math. They want the math kid like it's an engineering program. And so even though those test scores are the same, that 670 math score might hurt the kid because the kid's getting their test score based on other things. And I'm not using that as an exact example. I know kids have gotten admitted with, with various yeah. things, but even that total score sometimes doesn't tell everything that school's looking for, especially since you mentioned engineering, you know, they're, they're really focused more on math and science than maybe how you did on the English side if you send in a test score. Yeah, yeah, there's so many factors that go into it. Another resource is the common data set. So if you go Google common data set plus the name of a school, it's going to give you a really lengthy um, report that's going to show you like how they admitted students in the previous cycle. So in the previous school year, and that can be telling as well of like how many students, you know, submitted their SAT or ACT and things like that. So it's another resource to check out. Um, and then I was going to say fairtest.org is, is the website that shows all the colleges that are test optional or their test optional policies that they exist. And the majority of colleges are now test optional. Um, so utilize us as your school counselors and your college admissions team at the colleges where you're applying as you as your students navigate whether or not to apply test optional. Um, the next question is about letters of recommendation. So, Mrs. Hack, can you tell us, like, when do students request letters of rec? How do they do that? Can you just give an, uh, us an overview and some suggestions with that process? Sure. So, with letters of recommendation, something to keep in mind is that college applications sometimes require letters of recommendation from teachers, and sometimes they don't. As a matter of fact, there are some colleges out there who will not even accept a letter of recommendation. So, we always 
recommend to our students that as they are applying and they're on the college's website to really read through the requirements for the application and see if their colleges will accept one. Um, U of I, for example, will not accept one. So don't send one. It won't go through. So we definitely recommend that students um, see what their colleges require before asking a teacher. So let's say that they are applying to a college or two that requires a teacher letter of recommendation. Now is actually a really good time for your student to go talk with the teacher um, and ask them if they would be willing to write a letter of recommendation. Uh, we do recommend that the student asks the teacher in person, really kind of provides that personal touch and to see if the teacher would be willing. Another good time would be in the fall, uh, right at the beginning of college application season. A lot of students ask me, who should I ask for a letter of rec? We generally recommend that they select the teacher that really knows them best and that they have a good relationship with, or maybe even a teacher where your student overcame some challenges in that class and can really show some growth. Other colleges will request a letter of recommendation from specifically a math teacher if they are going into a math field or a fine arts teacher if they're going into fine arts. So again, it's imperative that your student really reads through the requirements on the application. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that teachers do require at least two weeks of a heads up um, for the letter of rec. It, they really put their heart and soul into these letters and it does take them time. So we recommend that the student asks their teacher no later than two weeks in advance. So in the fall, once your student has applied to their colleges, they are going to request a transcript, which I'll talk about here momentarily, in Naviance. And they're also going to put in their formal letter of recommendation request in Naviance. At that point, it will trigger um, a note to be sent to their teachers, where then their teacher will upload that letter and submit it into Naviance so that it goes through to all of the colleges that they're applying for. I know that's a lot of steps, probably a lot to remember right now. Keep in mind that the college dashboard has a whole section on how to request letters of rec. So that tile is very helpful. It has step-by-step -step directions to remind your student how to ask for their letters of rec and the timeline for that. One last piece of advice with letters of recommendation, we do ask that your student provides their teacher with a resume um, so that they can take a look at what your student does beyond the classroom. We really wanna make sure that there is a nice holistic letter of recommendation for your student that includes not just their academic achievement, but personal qualities, involvement, and their character as well. If your student needs some help creating a resume, there is a spot right in Naviance where they can make their resume right there. And then it's accessible to teachers and counselors as well. I'm going to hop in just for a quick second. So we had a great question that was asked in the chat box. Um, and I'm going to reiterate something that Mrs. Hack said and just make sure this is clear because we do get a lot of questions about letters of recommendation and how that process works with the student's application. So um, we do recommend that students, they ask for recommendations in person, if at all possible. If not, email is fine. But then we do ask that they send their teachers, counselors, whoever, if it's a staff member here at the high school, to put in a, we ask the student to put in a formal request through their Naviance account. And that way our staff members can stay organized with the number of requests that they're receiving. We upload and send all documents, whether it's us as counselors, uploading our recommendations, transcripts, et cetera. Um, our teachers will recommend their letters of recommendation and any sort of form that's required on their end. We upload all these documents through Naviance and then we send it directly to the colleges for on a student's behalf. Students cannot view the recommendations through their Common App. Again, the idea of a letter of recommendation is that it's written in confidence and that it's a true um, reflection of how the, the recommender, you know, what their opinion is of the, the student as, as both an academic student and as a person as well. Um, so these are sent in confidence. And so hence why students can't access the letters. They can on their Common App, however, or through if they apply directly through a college's website, they can typically check the status to see that it was sent and received. Um, so I, I will say that. But if a student does need a copy of a letter of recommendation, 
from a teacher um, or another staff member. Um, it, say they're applying for a scholarship and they need to include a letter or two, they can always ask the recommender for a copy. And most are um, assuming that they're positive letters of recommendation. Most are happy to share a copy so that the student can use it however they would like. Um, but I hope that provides some further clarity on that process. Um, on a similar but different note, Mrs. Hack, could you also walk us through like when do students request transcripts and what does that process look like? Sure. So when your student is applying for college in the fall, more often than not, the college is going to ask your student to enter their unofficial grades um, or unofficial transcript right there on the application. Um, what your student can do is they can log into their PowerSchool and over on the left hand side, they, there's a little button that says unofficial transcript. So your student can click on that and then in their application, they will enter the course name and then the grade that they received next to it. That's a part of the Common App as well. Many colleges are also going to ask though for an official transcript. They wanna make sure that what the student manually entered into the application matches up the official transcript from the high school. So in order to request that, your student will need to submit an official transcript request in Naviance. Again, step-by-step -step directions on how to do that is located on a tile on the BHS uh, college dashboard. And that tile is called how to request transcripts. Um, keep in mind that transcripts, it's not an automatic um, automated process. Um, once a student submits the request in Naviance, it can take up to two weeks for that to go through. Um, we need to make sure that for every kid, there is a form that the counselor needs to fill out that goes along with the transcript. Um, sometimes there's an evaluation as well. So it's not automated. So please tell your student that if their college needs an official transcript, request it at least two weeks before the deadline. Um, also, I would just say that if a student is applying via the Common App, um, it is going to ask them to input their grades manually. Um, so just keep in mind that the colleges may also ask for an official transcript. That's something that gets lost a lot with students. They say, oh, I already sent them my grades. I entered it into the Common App. But again, that's, this is why it's imperative that when you're looking through the application, they really need to read to see what's required. And if that official transcript is required, more often than not, the college won't review the app until they have all of the supporting documentation they need, like an official transcript. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is about, um, how, like, do we have any supports available for students who are completing their college applications as it relates to the essay part? Mrs. Yelm, would you share with us? Yeah, so we would highly recommend that our students start writing their college essays over the summer. It's a great time to start. They may have some more time without being in school every day. Um, and actually soon, so on May 8th, there's going to be a college um, essay webinar for our students. So I know some of you got that reminder yesterday, and I saw some of those already coming through that your students were already registering for that. So that's a great thing to have your students register for that webinar. Um, it also will be sent out for students that aren't able to attend. Um, additionally, I know that it's been mentioned a couple times in the fall, we'll have our senior college boot camp where students will have a chance um, to take those completed college essays or where they have a draft done and have um, college admissions officers read over those and give them feedback. So that's a great opportunity to take advantage of that as well in the fall after they've written their essay this summer. Um, and then the final thing is, again, on our BHS college dashboard, we have a tile called Writing College Essays that has a whole bunch of more um, articles to read and different supports that are there as well. Thank you. Um, our next question is for Mrs. Bernard. How many colleges should a student aim to apply to if they're applying to four-year colleges? So typically we would recommend that a student apply anywhere from in general three to eight colleges. Um, any more than that a student's going to get very overwhelmed by um, the, the various requirements um, needed for each application as they're completing scholarship applications. Some may have different essays so it, it, it does become very overwhelming. Um, so we'd, we'd like to see them target that down to about three to eight in general. Um, within those three to eight we always recommend that students have at least one to three safety schools 
is anywhere from one to three target schools and one to three reach schools. So what I mean by that is for safety schools, those are based on a student's um, overall GPA um, or possibly test scores if they're looking to share those, that their numbers are well above what, what the college typically accepts um, in the middle 50% of their students admitted. Um, target schools, those their numbers would be falling right within range of what that college typically accepts. And then of course, reach schools would be where students' numbers are maybe falling in the lower end or below what that college typically accepts in an incoming freshman. Um, but you never know what a college is going to be looking for in that given year. Um, if maybe they don't have as many students applying to, to that selected major for that given student. So um, again, we it's nice for students to have colleges in each of those categories, or I'm sorry, have um, schools in each of those categories just to make sure that they have, have backups if needed. Um, if a student is applying to a more competitive school, um, we will suggest maybe applying to a few more colleges, anywhere from about five to 10. Um, and then again, it, it, based on the major. So with engineering, nursing, for example, sometimes business, um, those are very competitive majors. And so probably in their best interest, the student's best interest to be applying to more schools um, than fewer, just so they have more opportunities and options available to them. Thank you, Mrs. Bernard. I'm going to kick the next one back to you that we got in because the bell's going to ring and it's going to get very loud for me. The last question, because I'm in the hallway and they're like in a secluded area, is how does this college application process work for students who graduate early? So students who graduate in December who are headed to Wabanzi um, to begin in January. So could you outline that process? Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, just making sure. So just so I'm understanding the question, so if a student is graduating early and their intention is to start at Wabanzi in the spring and then transfer that following fall, Sure. So the process really would not change. We just would want to make sure that we're we're working with them closely throughout the fall. Um, the only added piece for them would be they're looking at starting at a community college first. So we do provide a lot of support for our students going to Wabanzi. I should we I know we've really focused on students going to four year colleges, but I will say this to to those of you that have attended today. Um, we provide a lot of support because we do have a lot of students who start off at the community college level. Um, we know that it's an unknown process to our students. So um, we're fortunate that Wabanzi is in our backyard practically. Um, we have a very close-knit relationship with our, our reps there. They are here often supporting our students. Um, and so we would just be working very closely with those seniors if they're graduating in December and then looking to start um, at Wabanzi in January, making sure that they're getting off on the right foot and, and getting the classes they need. Um, we will support them with that. But as far as the four-year process is concerned, that would not change. They would be going through the same process throughout the fall as, as their fellow classmates. I'm going to chime in with just one added piece of information. If you have a student who is thinking about graduating early and starting at Wabonzi, knocking out some core credits right before starting at a four-year university in the fall, I would really encourage you to talk with the four-year university and find out their stance on transfer students. Sometimes if a student graduates and they enroll at community college before starting at the four-year university, they are then considered a transfer student and only eligible for transfer student scholarships, which are usually far less than an incoming freshman scholarship. So really kind of keep that in mind. That has nothing to do with dual credit. Students can take all the dual credit classes they want here at BHS. That would only be if a kid graduates early and then starts at a college in the spring. Now, if you have a student who's going to graduate in May, take a couple classes over the summer at the at Wabonzi and then start in the fall, that's usually A-OK -okay by colleges. Um, but just something to kind of keep in mind if your kid is going to start at a four-year university in the fall but wants to do some Wabonzi classes um, after they early graduate. Um, now, if your kid is planning on graduating early and then wants to do their associate's degree at Wabonzi, Awesome. The earlier they start, the better, and they can knock out their education and move on with the rest of their education or their career. 
Um, those are all of our submitted questions in the chat. I put a resource, it's bit.ly slash junior parent QA, um, and it outlines every answer we went through today in like a really brief couple sentences, as well as it has some additional resources for further exploration and links to a bunch of the websites that we shared today. So we'd encourage you to utilize that. You can make a copy and put notes on it if you want. Um, I gave you view access there, but we do have um, five or so minutes. If anyone has any questions or things that they'd like us to elaborate on, we'd be happy to stay um, as long as you'd like. I think Mrs. Hack is talking while she's muted, so I'm just going to let her know. <laughs> And it's funny, that's actually what I was saying, that you can take yourself off of mute and ask the question to us, or you can add it to the chat box if you prefer. Hi, I have a question. So what I understood, we don't need to submit the ACT scores at all. Um, who wants to take this question? Shall I? Okay. So, um, depending on what the college is asking for, a lot of, of our students all took the SAT in the spring and the SAT and ACT are two different standardized tests that all colleges accept for admissions. Um, so if a student wants to submit their SAT or ACT to a college that accepts it, they can. About 75 or more percent of colleges are what we call test optional. So if their grade point average in their transcript and who they are holistically outside of their test is a better um, predictor or better description of who they are as a student and the college is test optional, then they don't need to submit it. If a student specifically does not want to submit their test score, then they can find colleges that are test optional and go from there. And that can be a part of building their college list to determine where they want to apply. Dara, thanks. Yeah. Um, in the chat, we got the question, can you comment on applying to college undecided? And I know Mrs. Hack and I talk about this a lot, but the most common college major is undecided. So absolutely can apply undecided. On occasion, it's hard for kids to like transfer to a really competitive program within a more selective school. So be mindful of that. If, the, if your student's in the back of their mind, like, well, I'm either gonna go in undecided or aeronautical engineering, like that might be tough to get into later. But generally speaking, like as long as they're working with the college, going in undecided is totally okay. Do you have any other thoughts on that, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, again, like we talked about test scores, that's a conversation you've got to have directly with the school. I was just a Batavia on a college panel, and I remember one of the reps on our college panel said, if you're going into this major, you can't come in undecided. We never take a transfer. All right, you like you can't even start at Wabonzi. We're not going to accept you for this major unless you come in directly. And I mean, it was a it was a really good panel. There were schools from all over, all different sizes, things like that. And um, you know. At Illinois Springfield, for instance, it takes one minute to change your majors. We're, we're a school where you apply to the school, changing majors is freely. When you apply to Urbana-Champaign, you apply into the major. Some of the majors that, that I think Paige was talking about that you might want to apply directly into, one of them is theater. If you really are a competitive actor, if you don't get in, some of these top acting schools have fake acting majors. What I mean by that is they're never really going to do anything in it, but it's like a theater major. And then they have the one for like, it's like varsity JV and freshman team athletics. There's a varsity theater major. There's a JV theater major. And then there's like the club intramural theater major. Okay. Um, nursing is another one that we see sometimes really low transfer rates because it's competitive. I know the state of Illinois is way short on nurses, but there's, limited spots because typically nurses with that high of a degree make a lot more in the medical side than they do teaching. So there's limited amount of spots and there's limited amount of clinicals, which, which uh, make that a little bit tougher. Some of your really competitive engineering programs uh, will have some of that. Now, Wabonzi has a direct entry program with Urbana-Champaign for engineering. Uh, if you have a certain GPA, you're automatically admitted. But that's all stuff where I would tell you to talk with the school. But in 95% or so of cases, applying undecided is completely fine. And here's the best part. 
your counselors, as long as they're applying to common schools that Batavia students go to, and that's probably 100 and 100 or plus, they know where typically students are going and what those majors are that you would have to apply directly to. And so your high school counselors are normally a really good resource. Thanks, Aaron. Does anyone else have any other questions they want to ask before we wrap up our meeting here today? These are great questions. All right. Well, if no one else wants to ask questions, we will wrap up our meeting. Uh, we want to say a special thanks to Erin from UIS joining us today and sharing um, the perspective from the college admission side of the desk. It's so invaluable and we really appreciate you taking the time. And to all of our parents and guardians who joined us during their lunch hour, we want to thank you for partnering with us as we support your students in the college and career application and exploration process. So thank you all. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Hey, thank you. Thanks. Should I just end it? Okay. <laughs>